My name's Howell Prattley. I am a sculptor and a teacher, and I'm British. I am in my studio here under the district line uh, underground, although it's overground here in West London. I was a secondary school teacher, um, and you might think it would be art, but I had no art training as a young student. So I, I didn't have any art training at school, sixth form or university. So um, my path into teaching was through English. But when I was a school teacher, I, I was doing an evening class, a Thursday evening class in sculpture in a local community centre. And it was pretty obvious. I did that for about four or five years and it was pretty obvious quite quickly that it was the absolute highlight of the week. And sculpting with this group of people, usually from life, for two and a half or three hours on a Thursday evening was making me happier than anything else. So it was so clear to me that that was joyful that I decided to try and make a plan and focus on sculpture more once a week wasn't enough. So I, uh, I saved some money and I made a plan to go and study sculpture full time for a year. And that was in 2004 when I was 31. And one year became two, became three, became four, became 17 years now. It was so obviously the right thing for me to be doing that the path kind of made its way in front of me and um, opportunities arose. It sometimes seems that when you're doing the, the thing you should be doing, opportunities sort of present themselves because you are able to focus on them. So yeah, that was the, that was the way in. It was um, a community center in Shepherd's Bush in West London uh, with my wonderful teacher, Jan Buckley, who was a Royal Academician in her youth. Well, that, that means she remains a Royal Academician. Anyway, she's, she continues to teach that, that class in the Maspero Centre, uh, Community Centre. And when I returned from um, studying full time in Florence Academy, she invited me to take up the class that I used to be a student in. So I now teach two days a week in the community centre in Shepherd's Bush. Sabine Howard once saying in an interview with perhaps abstract art or conceptual art, you can talk about the meaning of it and you can talk about the concept behind the a piece of art until you're blue in the face. But the first impression is always going to be visual. And if the visual impact doesn't hit you in the stomach viscerally, then there's no point. The works of art with the most emotional impact on me have, have always been realism. I guess I'm at a stage, I think I'm early in my process as an artist. I, I've never been particularly comfortable in calling myself an artist. I'm happy to be called a sculptor. The journey I'm on is absolutely about learning the grammar of figurative sculpting. If that turns into something more rep, uh, less representational and more conceptual, then okay. That could happen, but I feel like I had to learn the basics, like learning a language. So I, I, see, I see the the structure, and the the, the structure of a, fi a figure's gesture, um, and proportion and anatomy as as the basis of understanding sculpture. And I was certainly always interested in clay from the time I was a baby. I loved getting into a mess and I loved making pots and pottery. And then when I was 13, when, when British children are 13, they, they are faced with a very important choice in the subjects they're going to study at the age of 16, 17. And in my school, one lesson in the art class decided um, whether or not I was suitable to take art for GCSE, which is 16 year olds. And sure enough, I did a really terrible drawing and they said, you can't study art, which on that day judged me unsuitable to ever touch clay again in my school days. That seems ridiculous. I don't harbor any anger about it because I understand as a teacher, the pressures that state school teachers are under. So it still goes back to that day, really, that I was told I can't do art. I've always um, made a little bit of time for myself in my spare time to work with clay. Somewhere in me, I've always thought, well, you shouldn't discourage people if there's any, any interest, any flair, any desire to play around with clay or materials for sculpture, then you should try and nurture it. And if there's a teacher in you, then, then you kind of, you'll find a way to teach. I think it's a shame not to do something if you can do it, you know? I think if somebody can benefit from something you can do, 
then it's it's a mistake not to follow that in life. I remember thinking when I was 17 and 18, wondering what I wanted to do professionally. I probably didn't want the hard work of being a teacher and a life in education because I wanted to, the only thing I wanted to do was travel. But I also remember thinking that the only valuable job in the world was teaching. I just remember having that thought. Of course, that's not true. But that was a thought, that process that I was going through. What possible job could be more valuable? Ultimately, the only thing that truly lasts is, um, is education. Working with models is about having a vision for what somebody might uh, be able to offer you and then potentially learning something that you didn't know you were going to learn from how the model is actually in, in space, in, in the time and in the conversation that you have together. I mean, portrait models, my God, I'm endlessly inspired by, by faces. I'm, I miss go, I miss traveling on trains because of lockdown, because on the London underground, you can sit and have five models opposite you during a, a journey on a tube train and take your pick in your fantasy, you know, a portrait model might sit and you think you understand what is going to come from this. And then the conversation that evolves during a portrait sitting will affect your choices in the clay that you apply to the armature. So I'm, I'm always inspired by life models, figure, model or portrait. I have a process where I think, OK, this is the sculpture I'm making. There's the finished thing. But actually, it's not finished if there's potential to find something different being born out of the mould at a future time. The element of surprise inspires me a bit. Well, the wonderful thing about the training I received in Florence Academy is the luxury of time. It's hard to believe that what's necessary in understanding structure, armature, gesture, proportion, anatomy, it's hard to believe quite how much time you need. At the beginning of the training in Florence Academy, for me at least, I was astonished that they would expect me to observe a model for so long in the same position, particularly in drawing because I was so clueless about drawing. Um, my practice in sculpture involves observing a model for a little bit longer. But as for making, making a drawing over days and weeks, are you crazy? But then you get into, then you get into an understanding of, of, of the techniques. Standing back, looking at the model, comparing model to, to armature and to the clay on the armature becomes fundamental. One thing I remember about this wonderful opportunity to spend so much time thinking about line and form, I mean, talk about privilege. The pattern in a morning, you arrive at nine o'clock, models up. The pattern of work is 25 minutes, five minute break, 25, five, 25, 50. Now, nine till 9.25, you're rubbing the sleep out of your eyes. Hopefully you had a coffee. You know, you're trying to wake up. You're trying to get yourself in gear. If you're very lucky, you'll be in gear by the second session. Generally, in a morning in Florence Academy, you will be, everybody in the group will be in the groove by the third session. Something magic happens, usually in the third session. And you can forget that you're half asleep. You can forget that you need a coffee. You can forget that somebody's disturbing you. You can forget, unfortunately for models, I have to say, although they're probably quite relieved sometimes, you can forget that they're even thinking, feeling, feeling pain, standing there, and you are finally at one with your clay. And that moment is so rare, and that's when it's really happening, that I think what's happening there is the ego has left you and you are in a zone where you're finally able to think about what's important in the line or in the form, what you need to do to get this piece of clay looking like that model. But there is a moment that you're sort of searching for with a model and it's golden, it's absolutely golden. And that's when, that's when learning happens, that's when development happens in the sculpture, that's whisper it, that's possibly when art happens. But it's very rare. Creativity is not always there. The genie is not always on your shoulder. And a wonderful sculptor, Laurie Shorin, once told me, if you're not inspired, just go to the studio. Just get there. And it's important not to be too hard on yourself if you're not with the genie. 
the idea that creativity is art has never really been the most important thing for me. I think art is something that might, might happen, whatever the hell art is. But the technique and the artisanal practice is a, a great joy every day. So I might get as much pleasure from making a mold or cutting a piece of wood well as I do with a model and sculpting a portrait. That golden moment when you're completely at one with the clay, your eye, your hand-eye coordination, the clay and the shape of the model is a moment when I think you forget yourself. You forget other things. Um, and it's a kind of a, a flow between you and the work, you know? And that's the holy grail, really.